Hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Gabriel Polly. I hold a PhD in Palestine studies from the University of Exeter, UK. I've been an activist for Palestine for several years. My writing has appeared on many different platforms and my first book, Palestine in the Victorian Age, will be published next year. to be used these wonderful speakers on this vital subject. Just a few days ago, I was speaking to a, a Palestinian refugee from the city of Akka, whose family were ethnically cleansed to the camps of Lebanon in 1948. And he insisted that the pivotal issue of the Palestinian struggle for freedom was return. And he was right. So welcome to this evening's webinar entitled Palestinians Demand the Right of Return which is the opening panel for the Palestinian Return Center's second annual Return Week, which seeks to mobilize Palestinians and allies around the world to call for and support the Palestinian right of return. Today's event is an online panel discussion, and we'll be hearing from Lara El Borno, Mariam Barghouti, and Ilan Pape. Um, and before we continue, I'll just introduce the My Return campaign which is a popular voluntary initiative launched by the London-based Palestinian Return Center in cooperation with national and international pro-Palestinian partners. The campaign was first launched in Jordan in cooperation with the Palestine Committee in the Jordanian Parliament. And the campaign culminates in a petition that calls for and reaffirms the Palestinian right of return. The campaign seeks to turn such an inalienable right into an international cause. The campaign seeks to garner the largest possible number of signatures on a petition confirming Palestinian refugees' devotion to their right of return. The petition clearly states that it rejects the so-called deal of the century by the US government and any other initiative undermining Palestinians' internationally guaranteed rights. Israel and the US have never ceased to undermine such an inalienable right to return by denying the refugee status of displaced Palestinians inside and outside occupied Palestine. The former US President Donald Trump's recognition of occupied Jerusalem as Israel's capital, the campaign waged by Israel and the US against UNRWA, the US suspension of its funding to Palestinian refugees, and the increasing calls to resettle refugees in destinations other than Palestine, are tactics which, though seemingly divergent, aim for the same goal, undermining the right of return. And although I've seen it put forward by the Biden administration, but the right of return will never be negotiated away or used as a bargaining chip. So this campaign is based on in the petition www.myreturn.net. The petition has already garnered over 1 million signatures. Please add yours now. Uh, before further introducing the speakers, if you have any questions from the audience that you would like our speakers to answer, please leave them in the comments and the speakers will answer them in the Q&A at the end of the event. So we'll now move on to our first speaker, Lara El Borna. Lara is a Palestinian-American international lawyer and activist based in Paris, though her family originally hails from Gaza and Yaffa. She dedicates a large part of her legal practice to human rights work, including accompanying asylum seekers in asylum proceedings before French jurisdictions. She is also co-host to a weekly English language podcast called The Palestine Pod, which aims to support the Palestinian struggle for liberation against Israel. Hello, Gabriel, can you hear me? Yes, yes, okay, please perfect. go ahead. So it's my honor to speak on the opening panel of Return Week 2021. Thank you to the organizers for their kind invitation. It's my pleasure also to be in the presence of my co-panelists, Professor Ilan Pape and Maryam Barghouti, whose respective works and efforts have, with rigor and precision, contributed to essential scholarship on the question of Palestine and the preservation of Palestinian stories and experiences from on the ground, 
confirming our struggle is a legitimate one, a struggle for human rights and dignity, and a struggle that will surely be viewed on the right side of history. I'm neither a historian nor do I live on the ground in Palestine. And while I will address some historical points and issues related to the facts on the ground in Palestine today, I defer to the experience of my co-panelists on these topics. I will instead begin with the experience that I know best, and that is the one that I live as a Palestinian in exile. I was born to Palestinian refugees in Kuwait in the 1980s. My family is originally from Gaza, and yet I never knew Gaza, although both of my parents and all of my grandparents were born there. My great-grandparents were also born in Gaza, with the exception of my great-grandmother, whose family hailed from the neighboring Yaffa. My 23andMe results tell me that I'm around 12% Greek, and I suspect that this is just because the Greeks were in Palestine many, many years ago. Like all other Palestinians, we are people of the land and have been in Palestine for as many generations as we can count. When I think of Palestine, I think of a life stolen from me. I often play out the counterfactual in my head and imagine what life would have been like if there was no Zionism, if there was no Balfour Declaration, no Nakba, no UN partition plan, no Der Yassin and the massacres like it, no Dalit plan, no Zionist militias, no conquest, no ethnic cleansing to further a settler colonial project, no apartheid and no Palestinian refugees, just Palestinian citizens of a state called Palestine. What if Palestine, like the other mandate countries neighboring it, was allowed to declare independence and become a state protecting the rights of all of its citizens without preference or distinction for any religion or ethnic background, without preference for foreign settlers over natives. It's a bold thought that I get lost in sometimes, and it's bold precisely because the reality, as we know, is all the contrary. If you're a Palestinian today, then the outcome of your life was shaped by external forces that you did not choose, but that were imposed on the generations before you. The Palestinian story is in large part the story of any one of a number of events which led to a family's disenfranchisement and separation from the land of Palestine and fragmentation from other Palestinians and Palestinian society. Either your grandparents survived the Nakba starting in 1948 and were made refugees internally or externally in neighboring Arab countries, Perhaps your family were from the Palestinians who were forcibly displaced in 1967, once again, either internally or externally. Perhaps members of your family were studying or working outside of Palestine and prevented from returning to their place of birth and upbringing because of their absence from the land on an arbitrary date. In other words, in 2021, going on 2022, we are living in an era of over 100 years of the denial of the Palestinian right to self-determination at the hands of over a hundred years of the implementation of a Zionist settler colonial project, which has been carrying out in a progressive manner the ethnic cleansing of Palestine to advance its interests as a settler colony. There is nothing controversial in my mind about the term ethnic cleansing. It is the appropriate term to describe what has taken place in Palestine on an ongoing basis since 1948 and even earlier. Ethnic cleansing, as we know, is the systematic forced removal of ethnic, racial, and religious groups from a specific area with the intent of making a region ethnically homogenous. Zionists themselves, with refreshing candor from the very early days of modern political Zionism until today, were and remain very open about their plans to ethnically cleanse Palestine of Palestinians in favor of Jewish settlement. In the early days, Jabotinsky wrote, there can be no voluntary agreement between ourselves and the Palestine Arabs. It is utterly impossible to obtain the voluntary consent of the Palestine Arabs for converting Palestine from an Arab country into a country with a Jewish majority. I suggest that my readers consider all the precedents with which they are acquainted and see whether there is one solitary instance of any colonization being carried on with the consent of the native population. There is no such precedent. He went on to say that the native populations, civilized or uncivilized, have always stubbornly resisted the colonists, irrespective of whether they were civilized or savage. 
history confirms that whether it be by brute colonial violence or attempts to dress Palestinian expulsion and Jewish settlement with a veneer of legitimacy by using and abusing the law and notions of state sovereignty, to be Palestinian means to grapple with some form of exile, the specific contours of that exile and the extent to which you are able to go back to Palestine, if at all, um, or even the extent to which you are able to move within Palestine, all vary based on the whims of the settler colony which has been established on your land and which controls every aspect of your access to that land. According to a recent poll, roughly one in two Israeli Jews want Palestinian citizens of Israel, i.e. 20% of the population of Israel who have Israeli passports expelled or transferred from the country. Studying the past also confirms the settler colonial nature of the Zionist project and uh, the subsequent Israeli state. In 1947, we know that Jewish land ownership in Palestine was 6%. Following the catastrophe of 1948, Jewish militias destroyed uh, around 500 Palestinian cities and villages across all of Palestine and seized 78% of the land of Palestine, making around 80% of the entire Palestinian population at the time refugees. It later military occupied the remaining 22% of Palestine in 1967. Israel has always pursued a single policy vis-a-vis -vis the land of Palestine and Palestinians, and that is to increase Jewish settlement on this land and to continue the expulsion of Palestinians from their homes across practically the entirety of historic Palestine. <clears throat> the story of my own family's gradual displacement from Palestine began in 1948. My grandfather was around 16 years old when the Nakba happened. For several year, years, he taught math in the newly established refugee camps for Palestinians who had been expelled from their homes in other parts of Palestine and concentrated into Gaza. <coughs> Following a deterioration of the security and economic situation in Gaza in the aftermath of the Nakba, my grandfather went to work in Kuwait as a teacher to support his family back home in Gaza. Living in Kuwait was supposed to be temporary, but with the military occupation of Gaza in 1967, prospects of returning seemed more distant than before. By the time I was born in Kuwait in the late 1980s, a considerable Palestinian refugee population was also living in Kuwait, very much in limbo without any clear future in Kuwait, but also without any clear way to return to Palestine to live with rights and dignity. In 1990, we fled the Gulf country becoming refugees again around the time of the Iraqi invasion. In our specific case, we sought political asylum in the United States, where I spent a large portion of my life growing up as a stateless Palestinian refugee, separated from my extended family who were scattered all over the world, not by choice, but because of the implementation of the Zionist project in Palestine, which led to our gradual displacement from Palestine and our inability to return to our land to live with rights and dignity. I myself have tried to enter Gaza on more than one occasion, but was refused entry despite my concrete familial ties to the land. <clears throat> but this is not a fringe issue uh, to the quote unquote conflict as politicians and commentators often would like you to think. While the public discourse remains trapped largely in this one state, two state discourse, I believe it is an immense distraction and a terrible mistake the Palestinian right of return must be central to conceptions of Palestinian liberation because there can be no true justice without the right of return of all Palestinian refugees, if they choose to do so, to their homes to live in safety and dignity. Israel could not have been established as a state for Jewish settlers on top of Palestine without the expulsion of the indigenous Palestinian population. This is a fact. And this is the original injustice, the undoing of which is a key to restoring the rights that have been violated. Some refer to the Palestinian right of return as not serious or impractical. The official Israeli position, which has been unchanged since 1948, is that Palestinian refugees and their descendants can't be allowed to return to their homes and the communities from which they were displaced because their return would threaten the maintenance of a continued Jewish demographic majority in Israel. But like all, uh, like all arguments rooted in Zionist ideology, 
this justification reeks of supremacy. If you are Palestinian, the right to not be expelled from your home is somehow being presented as obviously subsidiary to the desire for Zionists to maintain a Jewish supremacist state on the ruins of your house, which Zionists had to destroy in order to establish their state in the first place. The reality is that the only thing which is not serious is to be allowed to continually violate the rights of a people for over seven decades with impunity and to paint calls for the enforcement of such rights which exist and have been violated as impractical or asking too much. People forget that Israel's entry to the United Nations was conditioned on its acceptance of UN General Assembly Resolution 194, which is just one of the several sources of the Palestinian right to return under international law. And despite this reality, Israeli leaders have cynically demanded that Palestinians recognize Israel as a Jewish state as a precondition to negotiations which is nothing but a tactical maneuver designed to get us to essentially extinguish our right to return by subordinating it to Israeli racist demographic concerns in the hopes of just entering negotiations with our colonizer about our rights. In the meantime, Palestinians continue to visualize and attempt return. We have many examples to draw from, including the Gaza Great March of Return and the Unity Uprising of May 2021, which saw Palestinian refugees in Jordan and Lebanon marching towards Palestine in solidarity with their Palestinian brothers and sisters all across Palestine. We also saw uh, in May a surge of Palestinian solidarity from Palestinians in exile um, and uh, their allies with record numbers marching in cities across the world. As my time wraps up, I will just add that the future is necessarily decolonial and Palestinians must be prepared for return. Professor Richard Falk often reminds us that the colonial wars were all won by the weaker side militarily. To the Palestinians like myself, who now have passports of other states allowing them to enter certain parts of Palestine, Visit, as, visit the land as much as you can. It's really important to gain cultural education and maintain ties to the land. Learn the story of your family if you don't already know it. Um, as the Nekba generation today is very elderly, ask it as many questions as possible and, and, and record everything. Make sure that our Palestinian children, our descendants know our traditions. Um, they know our scholars, our thinkers, our artists, our folklore, our past, our present, and give them a vision for the future. Honor our Palestinian ancestors by doing the work that we need to be doing in the interim. So that also means supporting the Palestinian struggle for liberation with your words, your funds, and your actions. Like all empires that, that were founded um, on the basis of grave injustices, I do believe that the, the, the future um, of Palestine will be different than the past hundred years, and that Israeli um, settler colonialism and apartheid will not be um, uh, allowed to uh, persist in the way that we see it today. But in the interim, it's on us as Palestinians in exile to never concede our right to return and to do everything possible to prepare for a future reconnected to Palestine. And with that, I'll turn the floor back over to Gabriel. Thank you so much, uh, Lara, for really giving um, an incredible uh, personal and also a historical account uh, of the right of return and what it means to you and your family and what um, Palestinians and, and allies can do it, can do it to support it and make it happen. Um, so now we'll move on to uh, Mariam. Uh, so Mariam Barghouti is a Palestinian writer and researcher based in Ramallah. She earned a BA in English Language and Literature from Birzeit University and an MSc in Sociology and Global Change from the University of Edinburgh. Report and published various socio-political commentaries from Palestine. Her reporting and analysis have been featured in Al Jazeera English, The New York Times, The Guardian, Washington Post, BBC and Middle East Eye. She's also undertaken monitoring and evaluation missions of humanitarian and development aid in Jordan, Palestine, Syria, and Lebanon for various governmental and non-governmental organizations. 
Barahuti is also a policy member with the Palestinian think tank, Shabaka, and provides consulting on context analysis and risk mitigation and advocacy. And she's so I'll hand over to you, Mariam. And I hope my internet doesn't cut off and I don't hear you. I can hear you. Um, first of all, thank you for having me on this opening panel. Um, I'm very excited to be joining. Although I do admit, I think we're all, as Palestinians, very exhausted of repeating the same narrative that we've been repeating for 73 years. Um, but this time, perhaps this generation can come with a little bit more conviction um, and a little bit more hope and courage. So I kind of want to open this panel um, building on what Lara said, right? So it's expressing this um, experience of diaspora and ex expressing this experience of exile, which is not a state. Um, exile is not being in the U.S. that is not being in the refugee camps in Lebanon and Syria. A lot of us in Palestine feel like we're living a condition of exile. It is a condition of estrangement from ourselves, from our land, from our resources. Uh, and, and, and that's something we need to recognize, that it is a state that is enforced within us as Palestinians. There are 15 million Palestinians globally, and only um, and only half of them are really within, you know, Palestine. The rest are in exile, in, in physical exile. But what does that mean for ethnic cleansing? I think what we find currently is that we define ethnic cleansing as this violent and blatant and obvious expulsion of Palestinians, of a population. Ethnic cleansing is forcing a population to reach a point of despair, to want to leave. That is what it means to be driven out. And that is what the Israeli and Zionist narrative of will Palestinians just fled in 1948 means. They were forced out of their homes. We were trying to protect our families, just like we tried in the spring and summer um, of this year, where you had Palestinians uh, with Israeli citizenship having to stay in the homes of their friends together in groups because their homes were being marked by Israeli settlers that are called extremists and fundamentalists and supremacists. No, they are not the anomaly. They are what the norm is to a settler colonial state. And that is something we need to recognize, um, that it's not exceptional. The violence we saw is not exceptional. What was exceptional was the bravery in many journalists, in many policymakers, and most importantly in civil society to start calling it out for what it is. The words that we were criminalized in using apartheid, ethnic cleansing, settler colonialism, that is reduced to activist speech, but it's a reflection of our reality. And that is what right of return is. It is difficult to conceptualize, it is difficult to understand, it is difficult to imagine. But in the end, it, what is difficult is that us, as Palestinians, as the people directly impacted by this violence have to sit and convince the world of our right to live in our land without being colonized, without having a settler tell Muna al Kurd, a 22-year-old, learning how to defend her home, that if I don't take it, somebody else will. And these are words that we see go viral, but we forget. These are words that need to resonate, not to become historical archives, but to resonate as a reflection of this ugly, very ugly and brutal reality. Um, and as someone that does live in Palestine, I can tell you it is getting worse by the day. And the longer we stay silent, the more time passes and the more we see as our points as irrelevant. And it will always be relevant that no matter what, as long as we continue building up courage, 
as long as we continue building an up community. The right of return will no longer be a UN resolution enshrined on paper and shoved into a desk, but it will become a reality. Um, and it kind of wants me to come back to the practical aspect. I really hate speaking a lot and taking up space as though I'm lecturing, but this is a time where Palestinians are finally being given platforms. Um, so, you know, this is why I, I Seems like calling us Israeli Arabs, no, Palestinians. Palestinians Palestinians. Um, things like saying Palestine from the river to the sea has been criminalized because we're still confined to the international legal framework that has done nothing to facilitate, enable, and embolden the early settler colonialism. So let us also learn the concept of Palestine from the river to the sea. That means cities like Beka and Yaka and Salat and Akka. And the uh, are Palestinian. They are Palestinian and they are colonies. And it is okay for us to demand return. Um, and then another thing is to look at when we speak about Palestinians in exile or Palestinians in, in, in diaspora in solidarity with Palestine, they are not in solidarity with us. They are the backbone of our cause. Every refugee out there, every Palestinian denied entry is the spine of why we continue to struggle. The right of return, the right to build community, the right to grow, not in the way that the development sector sees it as capacity building and strengthening, no, but as building community, the right to grieve, the right to celebrate, the right to be banal. And that's something that we kind of just saw erupt, I think, in between April and July. It's not our courage and our bravery. It was our banality. It's me that had to learn how to navigate live ammunition, how to navigate tear gas, how to navigate the very vicious and brutal that the people down the street with ignorance. International community, the vulnerability of the international community, the international legal framework that they have built has constantly failed us. More importantly, we were able to force people to imagine, to say, let's take a step back and think about it. Let's take a step back and believe there can be another way of living together. Um, and then it kind of brings me to the point of a lot of things that we're also highlighting. But this is, again, for the longest time, it's been reduced to this reductionist view of either this is academic language or this is, you know, um, just this radical vision of people trying to say decolonization, this part of the ancient world. It is not the part of the ancient world as long as we have a living settler colonial community. Um, and as long as that exists, we need to continue decolon decolonizing the way we think, decolonizing the way we practice justice, and decolonizing just the way we interact with one another. And that means reflection. And that means being honest, there, there really needs to be a reality check on one, why do we still need Israeli voices to validate Palestinian testimonies? Why do we still negate the colonial history of places like the US and Euro European plunder? Why do we still question that justice is possible? Why are our minds still colonized? Why do we still carry these residual effects? How do we carry these residual effects? And I think that's what Palestine offered the world, that this is not just about Palestine. This is about our global interaction. And this is kind of also why we're still having these conversations. This is not Palestinian exceptionalism. This is the way the world is moving forward. 
Um, I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to uh, quickly interrupt you, Mariam. The the sound is uh, is a bit low. I think if maybe um, if we give you uh, maybe uh, one more minute uh, to summarize what you're saying, because I don't want to uh, to miss what you're saying. Just could you please speak quite loudly, and uh, hopefully it will be a bit better quality. Okay, well, maybe, maybe, um, maybe we should just take this uh, opportunity to move to Ilan. I think. Um, okay, we'll move to uh, Ilan as the uh, the final panelist of tonight's event. Uh, so, Ilan Pape is a professor with the College of Social Sciences and International Studies at the University of Exeter. He was formerly a senior lecturer in political science at the University of Haifa. He's the author of The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, The Modern Middle East, A History of Modern Palestine, One Land, Two Peoples, and Britain and the Arab-Israeli Conflict. Um, so please uh, go ahead, Ilan. We're looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you, Gabriel. Can you hear me? Um, uh, yes, but uh, just a little bit louder, if, that, if that's possible. Okay, let, let me put the mic a bit closer. Is this better? Um, uh, not greatly better, slightly. So maybe the problem is not with those who speak, but with those who are listening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so often. If all of us are I the think same go problem. ahead, Ilan. Let's go yeah, ahead. But you can hear me. Yes, yes. Okay, I'll shout a little bit. Okay. Uh, so I'll talk a bit louder. Okay. Uh, first of all, apologies for not being with you. I had infrastructural issues uh, that I hope are resolved by now. Uh, so I'm glad I still made it in the last uh, minute. I want to thank the PRC, uh, 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 Mariam, uh, Lara, and I apologize for not uh, hearing them before me. And thank you, Gabriel, for uh, moderating uh, uh, this uh, very important uh, uh, event. Uh, and indeed, uh, it is uh, surprising that we still have to talk about it, but it is very essential that we should talk about uh, the right of return, especially I think now that there is a, uh, a sense that uh, there is a shift in public opinion, at least uh, within civil societies uh, in the West and uh, in uh, many parts out of the West uh, towards the issue of Palestine, a shift that is not yet reflected. Uh, in the policies of governments, mainstream media, and mainstream academia, but nonetheless is, is very significant if it is compared to uh, many, many uh, uh, years ago. Uh, and that shift uh, is, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you have heard about it, uh, has also changed the language about the issue uh, of Palestine. And uh, people are talking about um, uh, settler colonialism, when they refer to Zionism, they talk about an apartheid state, when they talk about uh, Israel, uh, they don't talk anymore about the peace process, but about decolonization. I suppose these are the three most important uh, changes in the language that at least a large section of the global civil society has been willing to adopt, talking about uh, uh, Palestine. Uh, of course, these are not new uh, um, entries in our uh, vocabulary. Uh, uh, they have been suggested before by Palestinians uh, in the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, but they made the way again into the, the public uh, domain. And this is very good because language that does not describe accurately and correctly the realities on the ground is as harmful as uh, oppressive policies, uh, a continued colonization, and ethnic cleansing. And it seems that uh, 
within this new language, this old new language that people are using, uh, somehow I feel, and, and may, many of you may correct me, that uh, for some reason, the right of the uh, return somehow was, is dwarfed, is a bit forgotten. Uh, and uh, there are some understandable reasons for this, because if you talk about decolonization, you first of all think about people who live in a place, not people who used to live in a place. So you think about uh, uh, rejecting the two-state solution, which is what the international community was trying to, to tell us is around the corner and is the best solution. We understand that this is not the right solution. We understand that there is no solution around the corner and that uh, uh, Israel is actually an apartheid state almost all over historical Palestine and decolonization means uh, the uh, dismantling of uh, colonialist institution in the place itself. And maybe this discussion about decolonization or even decolonization of the mind or, or the country is, is uh, attached naturally to the people who live there, who are there, both Palestinians and, and Jews. But I think it is important to uh, uh, connect once more in a forceful way the uh, idea of the return, the right of the return, the sacred right of the return to the idea of decolonization. It doesn't appear in theoretical books that uh, decolonization goes with repatriation and so on, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that we are talking about the right of return for uh, three main reasons. And this is the ones that we should uh, highlight again even when we are now, many, so many of us uh, are uh, adopting uh, an attitude towards the reality which uh, is much more relevant to what goes on there than uh, our diplomats, uh, uh, ministers, politicians, and mainstream media do. So the three reasons is that, of course, first of all, there is this uh, basic human idea that people who were expelled and their families and want to go back to their homeland should be uh, should be given every help possible uh, to go back to the homelands in a world in a world that uh, tries to uh, deal with new refugee uh, problems of people who cannot stay in their homelands and are life seekers uh, in so many parts of the world and some of these parts of the world are not humane enough to to accept them and integrate them. So, so first of all, this is the basic idea of people who have a right to, to a homeland from, that was denied to them in the last 100 years. So that's definitely something that shows you that without that right being implemented, the whole idea of decolonization, the whole idea of getting rid of a settler colonial state or an apartheid state uh, uh, which will not be complete. And even if this kind of uh, aspect of the decolonization is not familiar to us from other uh, cases of settler colonialism, that doesn't matter. It is a very essential part of decolonization in the part of Palestine, so we should not marginalize this. And, and, and I'm very thankful for the PRC for, for reminding us a few days after the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinians that uh, El Auda, the return, the right of return, can be a major theme when talking about international solidarity with the Palestinians. So that's the first uh, issue. The second issue is that we are in, we insist, all of us, Palestinians and those who support the Palestinian struggle, uh, insist that uh, the events of 1948, the ethnic cleansing of 1948, cannot be erased from collective memory, cannot be denied is very much as the Holocaust shouldn't be uh, denied and should be commemorated, remembered. And uh, the uh, best way to rectify that crime against humanity perpetrated against the Palestinians in 1948, the best way to rectify it is by stating that every Palestinian who was expelled from 
Palestine in 1948 and their descendants have the right to come back either to a decolonized Palestine or a colonized Palestine, they would have to make up their mind and they have their, it's a sacred individual right that nobody has uh, any authority to deny or to speak on behalf of those who are the victims of the ethnic cleansing of 1948. And of course, as the Palestinians uh, remind us again and again, the Nakba has not ended in 1948. That's why they use the term al Nakba al Mustamirra, the ongoing uh, Nakba, because the ethnic cleansing has not stopped in 1948. It continued under the military rule that Israel imposed on the Palestinian minority in Israel, the 48 Arabs between 48 to 66. Dozens of villages were expelled. Uh, it continued after the occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, where uh, more than a quarter of a million Palestinians were expelled in 67 itself, and another quarter, a mil quarter of a million Palestinians were expelled throughout the years through various means of uh, uh, deportation and, and expulsion. So this whole uh, connection between the right of return and repatriation on the one hand, and the fact that ethnic cleansing is a crime against humanity that was perpetrated in 1948 and ever since 1948, is another reason why the right of return has to return to the, return to the center of our discussion on settler colonialism, decolonization, uh, and, and a different future uh, for everyone who lives in historical Palestine and everyone who used to live uh, in historical Palestine. And the third reason, uh, which I think is highly, highly important, and sometimes you can find it in the uh, research of scholars, sometimes you can hear it uh, from activists, but I may be wrong, I don't think we hear it uh, enough. And this is uh, a, a profound explanation why actually Israel or the vast majority of the Jews who live today in what is Israel reject the right of return. And why do so many uh, of Israel's supporters, Jews and non-Jews around the world, regard this Israeli rejection as acceptable, even moral and logic? If you look at their own explanation that Israel has given over the years uh, to whoever uh, inquired about their rejection of uh, the right of return, you can see that at the heart of the rejection is racism, pure racism. The excuses are about security, about uh, uh, punishment for people who were supposedly uh, uh, fifth column, who made a terrible historical mistake, but it's not Israel's uh, problem. You have to remove this uh, uh, um, rhetoric because it has, does not expose the real uh, and genuine reason why uh, those who represent the Jewish uh, majority in Israel and those who uh, are the policy makers uh, those who form public opinion, those who create the state and maintain it, are uh, view uh, the Palestinian through the prism of racism. And racism is a powerful tool because, it, as you know, in, in, uh, in Britain and many other places, it's a combination of hatred and fear. And it's very easy to, to uh, manipulate fear and to increase hate, uh, uh, especially in a situation where there is an anti-colonialist movement of resistance, as in the case of Palestine since the, the early 1920s, that like any other uh, indigenous uh, people refuse to be colonized and are fighting for freedom and liberation. But the fight itself gives an excuse to foment further the, the whole idea of, 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 of racism. And this is a very important conversation to have because it's very uh, easy nowadays, especially in places like Britain, to silence people with uh, accusation of anti-Semitism. 
And if you uh, uh, look at the, the heart of these accusations, you can see that the message is that many people can be racist. Christians, Muslims, African-Americans, white Americans, everyone in the world can be racist, but not Jews. Jews cannot be racist. Uh, if you accuse Jews uh, who happen to be Zionists, who are part of the Jewish state, if you accuse them of racism, you are immediately an anti-Semitic person belonging to uh, uh, heritage and history uh, that sought to exterminate Jews, uh, 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 to discriminate against them, and so on. And we should challenge this insidious and, and illogical uh, uh, limitation on our right to speak freely about what goes on in Palestine. This is not about strategy. This is not just about ideology. This is, and anybody who's been in Palestine knows it on a daily basis, this is about pure racism, the kind that uh, fueled uh, the hatred and the fears in places such as South Africa, in the south of the United States, and anywhere else in the world, where racism was either institutionalized or was used or weaponized by regimes to oppress uh, uh, other people. The basic reason that Palestinians would not be allowed to return by the state of Israel is the wish to keep the state as purely Jewish as possible, which is a racist idea. And uh, the reason there is a fear from any increase in number of Palestinians, forget for a moment the whole story of 48, forget for a moment the ethnic cleansing, is that uh, the one Palestinian more is one more person which is suspect, which is hated, which is feared. And this is, in an edu this is the product of an education system that is regarded to be uh, within the community of civilized nation, within the OECD. Uh, and, and, and I think everybody knows that this is the reality, but nobody does uh, to talk about it. This whole idea that uh, you can uh, uh, decide collectively on who the Palestinians are. They can be physicians, they can be poets, they can be men, they can be children, they can be women, but they are potentially terrorists, they are potentially people whom you have to fear, and these are people uh, you hate. Uh, we will not be able to uproot racism before we decolonize Palestine. We were not able to uproot racism in South Africa until today among white people. Nobody waited until the last person in white in South Africa, the last white person in South Africa, was uh, 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 was de uh, deprogrammed uh, from their basic racist uh, attitudes. I'm sure there's still many uh, white South Africans who are racist, but that did not prevent uh, a political transformation. That did not prevent the fall of a regime and the attempt, at least, to create a more just and equitable uh, regime. So we, this, I'm, I'm not pointing out to this institutionalized racism, which is the main reason for the rejection of the right of return of Israel. I'm not pointing out to it as an obstacle for uh, liberation. I'm just talking about it as something that has to be encountered and challenged, especially if you are silenced and intimidated by allegations of anti-Semitism. So I will finish by saying that uh, support for the right of return, support for the decolonization of Palestine, uh, uh, the support for the creation of one democratic state all over historical Palestine is part of a global struggle against racism. And uh, if someone accuses you, if you are part of that struggle, that you are a racist, namely anti-Semite, uh, I think we should be strong enough, resilient enough, knowledgeable about enough about our own moral uh, 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 structure and faculty to uh, reject these accusations and tell these people that uh, you are accusing anti-racists as being racist, probably because you are racist. And uh, somehow we have to shift this conversation in Britain from the conversation of anti-Semitism into the conversation of racism 
that doesn't have a hierarchy. Every racism is bad. There's not one racism which is worse than the other. All of them are deplorable and shouldn't be part of the society and should be uprooted. And we should try and put the conversation on Palestine at the heart of the conversation of racism in Britain that produces Islamophobia, produces anti-Semitism as well, undoubtedly, but has uh, uh, is also that kind of racism, that kind of support for racism provides the immunity shield for Israel to continue its policies uh, on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ilan. That was uh, excellent. And um, yeah, a, a very interesting uh, look into um, the, the settler psyche with regards to uh, the right of return. Um, I'm going to hand back now to Mariam because uh, we were experiencing technical problems earlier. And I'd like to just thank everyone uh, for their patience and staying with us for this conversation. Um, but I'll just hand over to Mariam for a few minutes or uh okay or maybe we'll maybe we'll move on to uh questions uh in uh, i think actually um uh, but okay so um i want to start with a uh, question about um really about the kind of events that we saw uh in may and the um the, uh, the, the huge kind of outpouring of global support for Palestine, which occurred at that time. Uh, um, of course, much um, events in Jerusalem, events in uh, Gaza, events in uh, 48 Palestine. Um, uh, and uh, the, I think the right of return and uh, refugees struggle was... Um, not really clearly articulated uh, by many of the voices, even pro-Palestine voices around, around those events. So um, I would like to begin by asking, what can the international community of specifically in solidarity with Palestine do uh, to, to raise the right of return as the center of the Palestinian struggle uh, at this time? if that makes sense. Um, I think I will, uh, I'll begin with uh, Lara, I think, uh, just to, I mean, you already touched on this in your talk, but um, I'll begin by handing over to you. Yeah, thank you, Gabriel. So, you know, when we look back at the events of May, um, I think that we have to keep in mind that when we talk about certain issues like Gaza, for example, oftentimes we speak about Gaza in a vacuum as if it's this sort of humanitarian situation that needs humanitarian solutions um, that you know will then improve the lives of people who are living there. But we fail to address the elephant in the room, which is that the majority of the population of Gaza are refugees from the creation of the state of Israel. They're not even mostly from there. They are from cities and villages which they were expelled from in order for the settler colony to establish itself on 78% of Palestinian land. And so when people in Gaza today continue to live under absolutely inhumane conditions, um, caged, uh, um, uh, you know, placed under siege, having their calories restricted, so on and so forth, and subjected to regular military assaults um, every couple of years, what we're seeing is a population which itself has this right of return, which continues to be denied to it. And then um, um, uh, put in the position to not only not be able to flee from Gaza, not be able to seek safety or become refugees once again, but also not be allowed to return to where they are from. And so the number of violations, the number of injustices which people in Gaza are experiencing at once, I think we cannot overstate it. My own family, my brother-in-law's family is actually from a city called Yabna, um, which they were expelled from in 1948 by the Zionist militias. And they were expelled down into Gaza and they lived most of their life in refugee camps in Gaza. And literally 73 years to the day of when they were first expelled from their homes in Yebna by the Yeshuv um, and made refugees and prevented from returning to Palestine 
uh, you know, in their communities, they were they lost their homes once again this past May by an Israeli airstrike on their residential apartment building. And so we see the story repeat itself. And, you know, just to conclude on this point, I think it's really important for people to understand. You cannot understand what is happening in Palestine, whether it be the events in May or the entire history of Palestine, if you do not understand that we are a people that have been made stateless refugees by an entity which has established itself on our land and expressly excludes us from it by definition. And so if you if your attempt at solving um, or being a being an ally to Palestinians um, involves anything but this essential um, acknowledgement, this essential understanding that if you don't solve the refugee crisis, the refugee problem, um, then you will not understand what the Palestinian question is about. You will not understand why Palestinians um, are resisting. You will not understand our grievances. Our grievances all go back to expulsion and displacement. And, um, and anything that comes after that is secondary. The original sin is the expulsion, is the dispossession, is the prevention of us living in our homes. Um, and like Miriam said, it's not always in this form of brute colonial violence where you are literally expelled, you know, at gunpoint. In many cases, like in my own family's case, it was just that my grandfather was unable to return to Palestine after having spent time outside of Palestine. And so then it became this waiting game where we're just in limbo. So I think people need to understand the centrality of the right of return to the Palestinian question. And it is everywhere. It, it's all over the injustices that we speak about. Um, and, and, and the example of Gaza and May, I think, is really telling. These people are refugees. And if you don't understand that, you can't understand their grievances. Thank you so much. Um, uh, OK, we'll hand over to uh, Marianne now. Um, if you can uh, please uh, yeah, talk to your heart's content on this issue. <laughs> Okay, I hope it works now. The internet here is terrible. Um, and let's let's link that back to the occupation because we only were granted like 3G in the past two years, right? That is technological exploitation. But when it comes to the right of refugees, look at what Lot is saying. Um, but look at beyond the words. Look at the experience day in, day out. The anxieties, the, the calls from family and friends that no matter where you are in the world, you are haunted. You are haunted by this pain, by this anxiety, and you have no idea what to do because Gaza is 45 minutes away from me, but it is stands between me and everyone in Gaza. It is an open air prison. Let's stop using euphemisms for anything that Israel is doing. It is not protecting it itself. It is not the policy language. It is oppression. And then let's speak about the fear, right? We keep thinking, well, how are we going to have all the Palestinian refugees return? First of all, most refugees may not want to return. Maybe they've settled and they don't want to. But it is about the choice. And that is the difference. It is about the choice and not having an 18-year-old soldier at Ben Gorion or Erez or Allenby Bridge telling you you can or cannot go see your friends and family. And other than that, on a practical level, studies have been made um, where it can be reapplicable to bring the refugees home, to not disturb, God forbid, we disturb the policymaking world or the UN resolution world. But that is also the point. It is time to disturb. It is time to disrupt. It is time to change. Um, and it is scary, but I genuinely believe that we've already changed. And it is time for the world to catch up to that and start applying it because it's honestly applying itself. Um, and other than that is let's respect the values we've outlined. Let's go beyond words. Let us go beyond slogans. Let us go to applicability. Um, and that is what Palestinians are pushing forward. And, and I think it's gonna take a lot of bravery, a lot of courage, but on a policy level, the studies have been made. On a pragmatic and practical level, they have been also made and applied. Um, look at Ikrit. 
Look at Ikrit. It is a, a, a Palestinian town that has been dispossessed in 1948. And still, the youth returned and settled there. And I'm sorry, but do we see any problem with that? No. Other than the joy and the celebration of those youth, the honored, the pains and the trauma and afforded themselves the ability to recover and heal. And we can apply this everywhere else. And I really think Lara kind of touched on everything so beautifully. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much, Marianne. Um, I don't know, um, Ilan, if you would have anything to add about um, how we can, um, you know, highlight the right of return in, in the global uh, solidarity movement and bring it back to the forefront. Well, I, I think you started, Gabriel, by saying that the May 21 events sort of uh, a bit evaded the right of return, if I understood you correctly, because I can't hear that well. Um, I, I think that actually um, it, it was obvious to people who were on the ground, and I, I was in, in Haifa at the time, uh, that actually it's very well connected, but it's quite possible that, you know, we were all so excited by 11 days of unity after 11 years of disunity to have 11 days of unity uh, of young people who do not carry the flag of that or other faction. Uh, Everybody is speaking the same language. Nobody's worried uh, that the Hamas is, is, is part of the coordination or that body is part of the coordination. We really experienced something. Uh, that I don't remember for a very, very long time. And believe me, I've been in this uh, struggle for, for quite a long time now. So maybe in the excitement of the sense of unity and resilience, uh, the obvious was not stated. And maybe you're right that the shouldn't. But, you know, Sheikh Jarrah, which was the, uh, the main trigger, uh, or one of the main triggers, I'm sure there were other triggers, but one of the main triggers was undoubtedly, if you remember, uh, the decision of the Israelis to evict a uh, few families from Sheikh Jarrah. This was the ethnic cleansing, the sinister planning behind it, the sinister ideas uh, after, after it was implemented that I think brought uh, to the fore the outrage uh, and the sense of injustice even more than, than usual because who were these uh, families in Sheikh Jarrah? Uh, they were uh, people who were expelled in 48 from the Western Palestinian uh, neighborhoods of the city. And they were uh, uh, moved into uh, uh, Palestinian homes in the Eastern side of the city. Now, of course, in the Israeli discourse that allowed even to discuss the eviction of these people, the fact that uh, 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 39 villages in the west part of Jerusalem, in the greater west part of Jerusalem, were ethnically cleansed, destroyed, and its people were, were uh, expelled. It was not mentioned as, as something that should be included in the discussion if even one Palestinian happens to sit uh, in a house that maybe a, a Jewish family used to live with it in the pre-48 uh, uh, mandatory years, when indeed Jews, Christians, and Muslims live together until Zionism made sure that the Palestinians are not part of the fabric. So I think that people were very much aware uh, that uh, the 48 is returning in 2021 and always returns in even a more callous and insidious way. And I think that in many ways uh, created one layer out of many of the of, of the of the new solidarity or the old new solidarity and unity uh, felt uh, on, on on the ground but there was another uh, um, uh, side to it which i think people who watch it from the outside were aware and i think that also helped to cement even more the international solidarity which already is there and this was the fact that the the, the jewish rioters with the protection of the police is something that uh, anyone who was exposed in any other country to right-wing hooligans attacking people of different color, of different uh, ethnicity, or even different gender, and the police standing uh, on the side and not doing something, is very global. It's very global. And to see that happening in Haifa, in Jaffa, inside Israel, 
totally uh, uh, debunked this Israeli, this liberal Israeli idea that there are two kinds of Israel. There is the one beyond the green line, where unfortunately, yes, you know, there is inhumanity and so on, and we are actually against it. And this one day will be over when there is peace. But there is inside Israel, you know, the democracy that still exists within the green borders. And this collapsed. In May 2021, it was clear that this is a charade that does not exist. So, so I think the, 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 the return and the reason and the ethnic cleansing were all the time in, in our consciousness, whether we were active on the ground or whether we demonstrated solidarity in those 11 days uh, with every Palestinian men and women who uh, were courageous enough. Uh, to uh, stand in front of a very callous and brutal uh, 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 oppressive regime. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Ilan. Um, I'll just uh, reopen to uh, Mariam if she wants to add anything to that. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ilan. Um, uh, I do want to make just kind of two points about this discourse. But one is, we constantly keep using this word evictions. It is forced displacement, okay? It is not people paying rent to a settler colonial state. This is forced displacement, and we need to re-enter that into the discussion. And we really need to stop saying Israel without perceiving it by a settler colonial regime. Again, validating the state of Israel as a state is legitimizing it within the global policy realm. It is not legitimate. The state of Israel as the apartheid settler colonial state is not legitimate. And we need to say that because so many Palestinians are being incarcerated right now for saying this as a form of incitement. So let us also bring forward, let us hire the ceiling of what justice is. And to keep speaking about the bravery and the resilience of Palestinians is also taking away of we do not need to be this brave, we do not need to be this resilient. It is time for us to be banal, it is time for us to be human, and it is time for us to recover. So as we also move forward and we build, we build on the knowledge that was exposed, we build on the, the, the you know, the efforts of historians that had access to archives that we didn't have access to. Right, as Palestinians, as someone that has done Israeli and Jewish studies in her academic research, had zero access to any of the archives that are often afforded to Israeli researchers. So we also need to look at that as a crime and an injustice towards us. Because what it does is it is being used as an extra validation for our testimonies. And it is time to say that the Palestinian testimony is enough and to move forward with accountability. Because if we keep speaking our stories, we will reduce them to myths and tales and archival work. But it is time to take them as testimonies and seek accountability. So I really want us to also move away from the way we address Palestine. It is not eviction. It is forced dispossession, like Edward Said said. It is dispossession, not just displacement. You are being dispossessed from everything you know, everything you own, right? And it is forced and it is violent. And then also move towards what settler colonial regimes are and invalidating them and delegitimizing them. It's not the state of Israel as a state acting within the UN. It is a settler colonial regime. And I really think we need to be braver in that. It is new, it is scary, but we need to do that. Thank you, though. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Maria. Um, I want uh, I want to ask another question, and then we'll see if we can fit in uh, one more. Um, I think the history of um, the discourse of return, um, you know, is, is incredibly strong um, in the, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, when it was uh, propagated by the Palestine Liberation Organization. And it was the, uh, as, as we know, it was the refugees in the camps of uh, Jordan and Lebanon and Syria 
who were absolutely at the forefront of that struggle. Um, and then, of course, with uh, the, the uh, late eighties and early, of course, for good reason, uh, the struggle uh, moved onto a new stage in, in occupied Palestine itself. But also the role of the PLO in uh, the, the Oslo Accords and uh, kind of uh, accepting a two-state solution and never explicitly but uh, tacitly uh, presenting to Israel a message that it would be willing to forfeit the right of return, speaking on behalf of Palestinians everywhere, but uh, a decision that was was absolutely not, uh, they were not asked and they were not supportive of that decision. Um, so I would like to um, kind of throw that out there, first of all, to uh, to um, kind of inquire on our panelists' thoughts um, about the uh, Palestinian political leadership, I'll put in inverted commas, um, and uh, the kind of uh, relationship it has to, um, to, to the return, which will happen in the future. Um, I don't know who'd like to, uh, to begin with that. Would you like to begin, Lara? If I can uh, dump you in it. Yeah, I mean, I'll be brief. I just, for me, this issue go, boils down to a very simple point, which is that you never concede your right as a precondition for entering negotiations, the outcome of which is uncertain. And this is unfortunately what uh, the so-called Palestinian leadership uh, did at the time, um, which was completely not um, supported by the will and the desires of the Palestinian people. Um, and you see the PLO going from being this sort of revolutionary force representing the, the case of Palestine on the world stage to then evolving into this organization that represents only itself and is fighting for its own survival and negotiating um, our Palestinian rights as a whole um, in doing so. And so f for me, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's very simple. You do not negotiate your rights. You do not concede your rights. Um, I think in exchange for, um, for recognizing Israel's right uh, to exist, the PLO had to accept, uh, the, excuse me, in exchange for the concessions that the Palestinians um, made during those um, uh, uh, negotiations, all Israel offered back was the right or, or the recognition of uh, the PLO as the legitimate representative of the Palestinian mm -hmm. people. Now, where does that get you? Nowhere, actually. You haven't actually obtained any rights. And so... Um, you're, you're, you're bargaining with your rights, you're, 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 you know, you're in discussions about your rights, but you're not getting anything in return. And so unfortunately, this is, this is something that I think, um, you know, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of all Palestinians, but, but I think based on the discussions that I've had and, 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 and the, you know, the materials that I've read, this is the major failure of the Palestinian leadership at that time, post, you know, 1960s, 70s, et cetera. And, you know, I'm sure <laughs> Professor Elon and Maryam can expand on this. Yeah, would, would either of our other panelists like to, to add anything? Any thoughts? Lara answered excellently. Look, maybe I can jump in. Professor, would you like to jump in? <laughs> okay, so um, what kind of I want to also add into Lara is also though, let's remember in those times that it wasn't just the PLO. A lot of people that were setting a new narrative were, you know, groups like the PFLP that is currently being used. You know, at some point the PLO was being used as you know the terrorist organization. Right now, presently in Palestine, it's the PFLP. It's people like Hassan Kanafani. <laughs> that were criminalized, that use narratives that are very similar to what Palestinian youth are using today, saying, no, we're not going to really compromise, and no, we're not going to negotiate with the very people that are oppressing us, that are abusing us. Since when has anyone, anyone told someone that is abused, just sit it out and talk it out with your abuser, it'll be fine. Never. 
never. You take them into a safe space, you hold the abuser accountable, and then you start seeking recovery and healing, right? Um, so also I wanna bring that back in because we tend to focus on the PLO and I really do think the PLO is dead. And I think the Palestinian Authority is dead. It is yet to catch up to its death and grieve it, but I do think it's dead. Um, so it's also looking at how Israel criminalizes as a settler colonial state, how it criminalizes any political affiliation. Mind you, I am someone that is not politically affiliated. And right now what Israel is doing is it's trying to find a way to criminalize our, our non-political affiliation. Okay, these Palestinian youth, well, they're raising their middle finger to soldiers. Let's criminalize them. These Palestinian youth are mobilizing in mass. They are speaking politics in the streets. Let's criminalize them. So it's also taking into consideration all these things, but taking away, let us take away the power from the PLO, from things like the Palestinian Authority that claims to be the representative of the Palestinian people. But as Lauda gracefully said, they only represent themselves. So let us also take away their power and bring it back to how any mobilization, any Palestinian mob political mobilization is being criminalized because that is the essence of the story. So I think this is where we start moving towards action against our perpetrators, rather than also focusing on symptomatic problems. I'm sorry, the, the PLO and the Palestinian Authority gained, gained whatever name they had out of the Oslo Accords. It was a dead horse born that we just kept beating at, beating at. And then what perpetrated that was journalists just constantly asking us, what do you think about the peace process? What do you think about the two-state solution? Moot points. And it is time to move forward from that. Um, Mabarf is a professor. Pape, if you have anything to add to that. Thank you both, uh, Laura and Mariam. Uh, very little to add to what you said. I just want to mention a different aspect uh, in relation to uh, Gabriel's uh, point. And I think about the 48 uh, Arabs who, who uh, you know, their, their political leadership for, for, for many years, probably until 1988, were hesitant uh, to mention the right of return definitely in their political platform uh, in the elections to, to the Knesset or even in the, you know, in the more uh, public uh, uh, domain. And it was the Lajnat uh, al-Muhajirin, uh, the internally displaced committee or the committee of the internally displaced Palestinians. We should mention those, you know, among the 48 Arabs there are more than 300,000. Uh, I think uh, Maria mentioned, or, or Lara Ikrit, I don't remember one of you mentioned, uh, Lara, uh, uh, Maria mentioned Ikrit, uh, a, a part of, of uh, a, a body called ADRID, an NGO that represents the internally displaced Palestinian refugees. Now, they did not wait for their political leadership to make the right of return a consensual point for a community uh, that is divided uh, politically, at least uh, in some levels, between uh, the left, uh, the national movement, the, the political Islamic movement, and so on. Uh, they worked on the return, and, and they also challenged quite uh, uh, successfully both uh, uh, the, the, the powers that be and the international community by saying, you're using the demographic uh, excuse that additional number of Palestinians would change the demographic balance in the state. Well, we are internally displaced uh, people, but we are demographically here. So why don't you allow us to return, okay? And, and uh, the, the Supreme Court in Jerusalem was playing with games saying, yes, of course you're right, but the army doesn't want, it doesn't matter. They created uh, an, an annual day of return since 1988 where thousands of thousands of Palestinians inside uh, go to one of the destroyed Palestinian village, hear the, the survivors of the ethnic cleansing, uh, all those who heard them before, and commemorate uh, both the Nakba and uh, uh, this is a show, a display of force uh, in support of the right of return. And I can mention uh, 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 projects like Udna, 
uh, and other projects where young Palestinians inside, among the 48 uh, uh, Arabs, have built models of both how the destroyed villages looked like, and even more important maybe, how the reconstructed villages would look like once return is uh, enacted. In other words, it's not only up to political leadership, whether it's legitimate or not, whether it's united or not. Uh, the right of return is so encompassing as, uh, as part of an identity, as part of a, a compass for the future, that it has daily expressions uh, that do not necessarily come out in a speech by a politician or a political platform by, by a party. Uh, you can build a model, you can draw a picture, uh, you can have a ceremony, uh, you can make sure through documentary films and plays that all that this is something that is at the very heart of what had been done to you, what is being done to you, and what should, should be stopped being done to you. And, and I think this is something that um, we should not forget is happening. So we don't even have to call for the people to ignore if there is a political leadership that ignores the right of return. We don't need to, uh, you know, alert the people to that. They're doing that. Each one in their own way, each one. Sometimes it's a community of a, a, a village that was destroyed. Sometimes it's a young, it's a generational thing. Sometimes it's an occupational thing. Uh, but we should, we should definitely remember that this is a very, very powerful and essential part of being a Palestinian, being part of the solidarity movement uh, with the Palestinians. Thank you so much, uh, Elan. I don't know whether um, either uh, Lara or Mariam has anything very brief to add, or I think uh, I think um, Elan's point, uh, you know, looks forward to the future of return and the reality of return, which is, uh, you know, a fantastic point for us to uh, round off this uh, ex extremely enlightening session. Um, so I would, uh, yeah, I would like to thank uh, all three of our guests um, who have spoken brilliantly despite some technical problems and, and uh, difficulties going on, but thank you so much. Um, and I would like to thank all everyone who's watching. Um, apologies if you asked the question and we didn't have time to fit it in. Um, I'll remind you once again to uh, please sign the My Return uh, petition at myreturn.net and also to keep a lookout for uh, PRC's upcoming events, including the second event of Return Week tomorrow, which is the Interconnected Struggle, Palestine and the World, and three other events this week, uh, which will also be live streamed from where you're watching now on Facebook or YouTube. So thank you once again to our fantastic panelists. Thank you to our audience and uh, have, a, have a good evening uh, wherever you are. Thank you.